Chapter Eighteen of The Conquest of Richard Grant by Oliver Optic. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eighteen: Richard Wins Another Race, and Tunbrook is Mutinous. It was a proud moment for Richard Grant when he rose from the stern sheets of the Emma and found the Alice was two or three lengths behind, and when he heard the shouts of his friends rend the air, it was victory another triumph over the regulators who had threatened to make tunbrook too hot to hold him they did not get ahead very fast and he felt that his conquest over them was complete the hour of prosperity of triumph is the most dangerous period in the experience of a young man he is on the top of the wave and he sees not the dark abyss that yawns on either side of him truly we need adversity to keep us from forgetting god and duty to keep us from forgetting that truth and justice are more mighty than mere success but when richard came to tunbrook he came with a solemn resolution to forsake the error of his ways and find happiness in the path of recitude whatever success had attended him he attributed to the influence of this good resolution he had manfully resisted temptation he had cured himself of several bad habits and he had made good progress in the conquest of himself he had often felt an inclination to resent with hard words and heavy blows the sneers of the nevers faction but he had controlled himself and each victory of principle over inclination had made him stronger in his purpose to do right Bertha's answer to his letter, in which he had informed her of his election to the post of sergeant, cautioned him against being too much elated by his good fortune. She hoped his promotion would not make him think too much of himself. When he realized that he had won a new victory, when he heard the boys shouting his name, the words of his sister came to his mind, and he determined to bear his honors meekly and to feel kindly towards nevers and his friends as they pulled to the stake boat richard cautioned his crew not to crow over the fellows in the other boat for it was a friendly contest and he did not wish to see any ill feeling on either side the alice was already alongside the sailboat nevers was in no enviable frame of mind he looked dark and sour and richard only bestowed one glance upon him lest his looks should be misconstrued grant you have won the race said colonel brockridge as the emma came up i had no idea of such a result three cheers for grant shouted an enthusiastic boy in the sailboat no added the principal as he glanced at the crestfallen coxswain of the alice and saw that he was taking his defeat very hardly you have cheered enough we don't want any unkind feelings to grow out of this affair nevers you have been beaten but i shouldn't have been if i had had fair play growled nevers whose anger was manifest in his tones has there been any foul play demanded the colonel yes sir there has replied nevers sharply what was it the fellows in the emma took her out of the water cleaned her and covered her bottom with black lead i don't see any unfair play in that you had the right to use your time for preparation as you wished said the principal he couldn't have beat if his boat hadn't been in better condition added nevers it is a good driver that keeps his horse in good condition i think it is rulable for each crew to prepare their boat as they think best well he beat us by a trick what did they go down the river for to haul up their boat that is their business i see you are not satisfied nevers no sir i am not i like to have fair play in these things so do i said the colonel with a quiet smile and i think you had better try this thing over again now suppose you exchange boats and pull round once more that we may see how much good the black lead did what do you say grant i am willing sir replied richard we are all fagged out now sir interposed nevers i proposed this method to remove your objections to the race nevers you might have cleaned your boat if you had been so disposed i didn't think of it snarled nevers 
if a general should get beaten because he did not think to bring up his ammunition or by neglecting any precaution his want of forethought would hardly be deemed a sufficient excuse i should like to have you exchange boats for a short pull if you don't go round the island we are tired out sir the other crew have pulled the same distance you have added the principal try it nevers try it whispered redmond we shall be laughed at for a month if we don't we will whip them this time i am willing to try it sir said nevers though his words belied his feelings both crews were somewhat rested from the fatigue of the race and they exchanged places in the two boats taking the positions assigned to them we shall get beat this time sure said bailey no we won't replied richard well if you say so then we shall not it would be the greatest thing that ever was if we should whip them again it will show that black lead isn't a great institution after all no it won't those fellows don't pull worth a cent if they can't do better than they did before we shall whip them all to pieces now mind what i told you don't hurry and keep cool the signal was given and the two boats dashed off the race was very nearly a repetition of the first one richard kept a sufficient quantity of muscle in reserve for the last half mile of the race and came in about a boat length ahead of the emma the one and a half lengths difference in the two races seemed precisely to indicate the amount of virtue in black lead again the thundering cheers of the grant party reverberated over the lake and through the grove nevers was astonished as well as angry and his face was darker than ever are you satisfied now nevers asked the colonel when the alice and the emma came alongside the stake boat yes sir replied he desperately but i don't understand it i do said the principal the other crew pull better than yours i never saw better pulling in my life than those fellows showed us i hope there is no hard feeling between you no sir replied nevers but his looks and his tones belied his words he will pull us all down at this rate muttered redmond as the emma left the stake boat something must be done added nevers he has got half the fellows on his side now what shall we do asked redmond who seemed to regard it as a hopeless case we'll fix him yet some earnest conversation followed these remarks it was carried on in whispers and entirely suspended when the alice approached the boats were secured and both crews landed grant you have beaten me fairly and there is my hand said nevers when the two coxswains met on shore richard was utterly confounded by this show of good will on the part of his rival he took the preferred hand and gave it a hearty pressure thank you nevers it is very kind of you to treat me in this handsome manner i'm sure i don't feel any ill-will toward you replied richard we will be friends grant and perhaps you will tell me how this thing was done with the greatest pleasure you have some secret in rowing i will tell you all i know about it any time you please said richard frankly thank you you are the first fellow that ever beat me rowing and i honor you for it but i don't understand it shall we be friends now grant with all my heart richard could not have been more astonished if the sky had fallen than he was when his great enemy approached him with words of kindness and conciliation he could scarcely believe his senses but there was nevers by his side as good-natured as though he had won the race and more than this the rival crews were suddenly on the most excellent terms and were fraternizing like brothers nevers had evidently given up the point and intended to withdraw all opposition to the advancement of richard nevers and his friends seemed to be sincere and the hatchet appeared to have been actually buried richard was so well treated by them that he came to the conclusion that the regulators had been dissolved or at least that they had turned their attention to some more promising field of labor on the first of november when the boys assembled for morning prayers the principal announced a new regulation requiring every member of the institute to be indoors during the off time from seven till nine in the evening before they had been permitted to go where they pleased during these hours as long as they did not leave the estate but some of the boys had been seen in the village of tunbrook after eight in the evening 
and all efforts to discover who they were had been unavailing. The prohibition had been made to correct this evil. When the new regulation was announced, there was a general murmur of disapprobation among the students, for some of their best sport had been enjoyed out of doors, after dark. No one ventured to remonstrate, but the order was exceedingly unpopular. "'I won't stand it,' said one and another, during the first recreation hour in the afternoon. "'It's too bad. It will spoil all our fun.' "'The fellows are all agreed on this point,' said Redmond. "'I am willing to observe all reasonable regulations, "'but we might as well go into a monastery as submit to this thing,' added Nevers. "'What do you say, Grant?' "'I don't like it. We intended to have a first-rate game of football these moonlit evenings.' "'There isn't a fellow in the school that likes it,' said Redmond. "'That's so,' replied Bailey. "'I don't see the use of the rule either. "'Nor I. "'Some of the fellows have been down to Tunbrook almost every night.' "'What's that to us, as long as we didn't go?' said Bailey. "'The innocent ought not to be punished with the guilty.' "'The colonel couldn't find out who they were,' said Redmond, with a kind of chuckle. "'No fellow would blow on the others.' "'It is easy enough to talk,' said Bailey. "'But what are you going to do?' "'Do?' "'Why, resist it, of course,' replied Redman. "'I am ready to do so, for one. "'Let us all stay out to-night till nine o'clock.' "'Agreed,' added some of the larger boys. "'We shall get punished if we do,' suggested Bailey. "'No matter. "'They will have to punish the whole crowd. "'The guard-house won't hold us all,' replied Redman. "'Let us have a plan about it. "'We will get up a regular mutiny,' said Nevers. "'If we can get a hundred fellows to go with us, "'we shall make the old man cave in.' "'Good, Nevers. Let all the fellows that will join meet under the big oak by the river at five o'clock, or as soon as we get out of school. Let each fellow talk it round in a quiet way, but don't let the teachers hear a word.' "'Will you be there, Grant?' asked Nevers. "'I don't know. I will see.' "'Don't know,' said Nevers. "'Don't you see all the fellows are in for it?' "'I will think of it,' replied Richard, as he walked away. End of chapter 18 Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana. Chapter 19 of In School and Out The Conquest of Richard Grant by Oliver Optic. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 Richard is Determined, and Some Illusion is Made to Watermelons. There had been a time when Richard Grant would have desired no better fun than to engage in such a mutiny as that proposed by Nevers and Redmond, and he was not yet so far removed from his evil propensities as to be able to decline the proposition. The boys of the Institute believed they had a real grievance, for it seemed harsh and needless to deprive them of some of their best hours for amusement. It looked just as though the principal was angry, because he could not ascertain who had broken the rules of the school, and spitefully intended to punish the innocent with the guilty. Probably none of them intended to carry their opposition any farther than to express their disapprobation of the new regulation. The colonel was a universal favorite and they had full confidence in his judgment and his justice. Perhaps the desire to have a little fun and excitement was the strongest motive that actuated them. During the afternoon, the plan to redress their grievance was whispered among the boys. All the fellows who were going to join the mutiny was the strongest inducement that could be used to obtain the consent of the timid ones, and if all were going to join, it would require a great deal of moral courage to stand aloof from the scheme. Richard was sorely perplexed. With the others, he felt that the new regulation was arbitrary and unnecessary, and such a scrape as the boys proposed was exactly in accordance with his antecedents. He wanted to join for the fun of the thing, and because the rest of the boys were going to do so. He did not like to be singular. Besides, he might injure his popularity, and lose some of the influence he possessed if he refused to join. The temptation was so strong that he could not at first resist it, and though 
he did not positively promise to meet the others under the big oak he gave them some encouragement that he would do so the little time he had to think of the matter during the study and recreation hours did not enable him to arrive at a conclusion and at five o'clock when school was dismissed he was still halting between two opinions when he left the schoolroom he fixed his mind upon the question and began to discuss it in the most vigorous manner he knew that any resistance to the authorities of the school was wrong colonel brockridge had made the rule and it was his duty to observe it what would bertha say after he had given her such a glowing account of his success in overcoming temptation when she was informed that he had joined a mutiny i'll keep my resolution said he stamping his foot upon the ground to emphasize his determination i'll stand out against the whole of them half past five came and nearly every boy in the school had gone to the appointed place richard sat on the bench at the foot of the flagstaff on the parade ground thinking whether his duty required him to do anything more than simply refuse to join the mutiny somehow it entered into his head that it was his duty to prevent the rebellion if he could it even occurred to him that he ought to inform colonel brockridge of the intention of the students and thus place himself on the side of law and order but he rejected this suggestion it was so utterly repugnant to his nature he could not tell tales out of school if anybody's life property or happiness had been at stake he might have felt differently richard was a novice in advocating the claims of law and order of truth and justice and he was more easily satisfied than some would have been in a similar situation while he was debating this matter with himself nevers bailey and redmond approached and interrupted his meditations they appeared to be a committee appointed to wait upon him and ascertain his views upon the momentous question you didn't come down said nevers no i have concluded not to join in the scrape replied richard gravely why not because i don't think it is right and i think if we speak to the colonel about the matter he will make it all right i tell you grant he has no right to make such a regulation added nevers with energy and i for one am not going to beg him not to do that which he has no right to do come grant you are almost the only fellow in the school who won't join the mutiny said redmond the fellows are all in for it and you had better come added bailey no i won't join replied richard decidedly come down to the grove whether you join or not suggested nevers i am willing to go down to the grove but i shall not go in for this scrape come along then the boys walked over to the grove the committee using all their eloquence and logic to induce richard to change his mind but thus far he remained firm and loyal to his good resolution his arrival at the grove created a sensation for it seemed to be evidence that he was to form one of the party the position of richard grant on the present occasion was so novel that he could hardly believe in his own identity like the old woman with the little pig it did not seem to be he that was refusing an invitation to join in a scrape so harmless as the one proposed and he almost needed an introduction to himself but richard was himself truly himself himself in the highest and noblest sense his determination to keep his resolution seemed to create around him an atmosphere of purity and the more he breathed it the firmer and the stronger he became the boys exhorted him singly in couples and by squads to join the foolish enterprise but without effect better come with us grant said nevers we have got a first-rate plan and we shall have a tip-top time i have fully made up my mind not to go replied richard i shall not go if grant doesn't added bailey nor i said another 
back out, will you? sneered Nevers, his face darkening with an expression of anger. I said I would join if Grant did, replied Bailey, stung by the reproach. Most of the boys were silent for a time, for the decided and unexpected stand taken by Richard, the favorite of the school, altered the complexion of the whole affair. This silence was succeeded by a more unequivocal demonstration. One after another followed the example of Bailey, and deserted the bad cause, till Richard found himself no longer alone, but supported by at least thirty of the best fellows in the Institute. And then they began to come over in squads. "'You are the meanest set of cowards I ever saw in my life!' exclaimed Nevers bitterly, when the enterprise appeared to be fully nipped in the bud. "'Grant is right,' several of the boys replied. "'Grant!' sneered Nevers angrily. "'He wasn't always so nice as he is now.' "'That's so,' said Redmond, as he placed himself by the side of the bully. "'We know a thing or two about Grant before he became pious.' "'What do you mean by pious?' demanded Richard, stepping up to the speaker, and as he did so, his fists were involuntarily clenched. "'Watermelons!' replied Redmond vindictively. "'Watermelons!' added Nevers. "'Watermelons!' responded a dozen or more of the large boys who had gathered around Redmond. "'Do you walk in your sleep any now, Grant?' said Redmond with a mocking laugh. "'You wasn't pious then.' Richard was so mortified and confused by these taunts that he wished the earth might open and hide him from the exulting gaze of his assailants. His blood boiled with shame and indignation, and more than ever before he realized that the way of the transgressor is hard. His first impulse was to rush upon his dastardly foes and crush them beneath the weight of his strong arm. Most of the boys looked at each other with astonishment, wondering what could be meant by watermelons, and walking in his sleep. It was evident to Richard that only a few of his companions understood the reflections cast upon him. There he stood, trembling, as it were, in the balance, and ready to be carried up, or down, by this new and most terrible trial, up into a higher sphere of virtue, or down into a deeper degradation than any he had yet fathomed. "'I will be true to myself,' said he to himself, after he had stood silent for a moment, blushing with shame, and assailed by the foe without, and the foe within." His clenched fist unclosed, the muscles relaxed, and though his face was still red, a smile of triumph played upon his lips. "'Will you go, watermelons?' sneered Redmond. "'I will not,' replied Richard. "'Shut up, Redmond,' interposed Nevers, who entirely mistook the singular change which had come over Richard's countenance. "'Come, Grant, you and I will talk it over alone.' and he took his arm and led him away from the crowd. "'You see, we know all about these things,' continued Nevers. "'But we don't want to be hard upon you. Only about a dozen of us know anything about those scrapes.' "'Who told you about them?' asked Richard. "'That's nothing to the purpose. You are a good fellow, Grant, and I advise you to join us. If you do, not a fellow shall ever say a word about watermelons or sleepwalking.' I will not join you, whatever you say, and whatever you do. Then you won't hear anything but watermelons while you stay here. I called you out as a friend, and I think you had better go with us. I will not. Then we will tell all the fellows. I will save you the trouble by telling them myself. Come, Grant. I will not. Go it, then, watermelons, said Nevers, as he ran back to the others, and told them, of the result of the interview. Richard wondered who could have informed them of his scrapes, but he could form no idea. Lest our readers should be equally in the dark, we will tell them, confidentially, that Sandy Brimblecombe had done the mischief. A cousin of his, 
on his way to Tunbrook, had stopped a day in Whitestone. This relative was, unfortunately, one of the Nevers's faction, and the information he brought was carefully preserved for an emergency. "'All who join come under the big tree,' shouted Redmond. "'If you walk in your sleep, Grant, perhaps you will pay us a visit.' "'Asleep or awake,' replied Richard calmly, but forcibly, "'I shall know enough to keep out of bad company.' "'Do you mean me by that?' demanded Redman, rushing up to Richard and shaking his fist in his face. "'I do.' "'Then take that!' and Redman struck Richard in the face. The latter did take that, but the next instant his assailant lay upon the ground where Richard, with a single blow, had thrown him. "'None of that, Redman," interposed Nevers. "'The colonel will be down upon us.' "'Let's lick him,' said another." "'I am ready,' coolly replied Richard, throwing off his coat. But prudence carried the day, and the mutineers retired to the big oak. Only about fifty, or one-fourth, of the students responded to the call of Redmond, and the rest retired from the ground. "'What did they mean by watermelons?' asked Bailey, as they walked up to the Institute. "'I'll tell you all about it,' replied Richard." I got into some scrapes before I came here, and he told his companions the whole story. But, fellows, I have turned over a new leaf. Good, said Bailey. I am glad you told us, and I'm sure no decent fellow in the Institute will ever fling it at you. Richard felt better when he had told the whole truth. He confided in his friends, and feared not his enemies. When they reached the parade ground, they saw that the mutineers had taken possession of every one of the boats, and were sailing up the lake towards Green Island. They dared not return to the Institute, fearing that their plan might be discovered. Richard was informed that arrangements had been made before he joined them, that they intended to take all the boats, so that the instructors could not reach them and encamp on the island. When the rolls were called, the absence of about fifty of the boys was discovered by the teachers. The truth came out, and the sharp eye of Colonel Brockridge seemed to glow with unwonted luster. End of chapter 19 Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana Chapter 20 of In School and Out The Conquest of Richard Grant by Oliver Optic this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 Richard Visits Green Island and the Regulators Consider Their Plans The evening exercises proceeded as usual, no allusion whatever being made to the absence of the mutineers, after the facts had been revealed. But no one supposed that the energetic principal would drop the matter where it then stood. Richard had been putting that and that together since the events which had transpired in the grove, till he was pretty well satisfied that the mutineers now upon Green Island were the regulators. The evidences which led him to this conclusion had been carefully collected from the time he had been whipped by them in the woods near his camp. Though Nevers had appeared to be very friendly since the race, his conduct had not been above suspicion. During the evening the boys had a great deal to say about the mutiny, and some of them even regretted that they had not joined, especially as the colonel did not seem to care much about the affair. About eight o'clock in the evening Richard was sent for by the principal. Grant, said Colonel Brockridge, as Richard entered the office, I have heard all about your conduct and I wish to express to you my approbation. You have, indeed, turned over a new leaf, as you told the boys, and I congratulate you upon your success in keeping your good resolution. I have just written a letter to your father, which you may read. The principal handed him the letter, and with a glow of pride and satisfaction Richard read the high commendation which was bestowed upon him. There was no allusion to the affair of the day, and the praise covered his general conduct since he had been at Tunbrook. I learn that you have been true to yourself, 
and true to the rules of the institute under peculiar trials i sympathize with you but you have won the respect and regard of all the good boys you can afford to be disliked by the others i have tried to do my duty sir replied richard blushing at the praise bestowed upon him you have done well i know how fond you are of exciting adventure and i wonder that you had the strength to resist this temptation i am surprised myself added richard if i accept the fight which was greatly palliated by the circumstances and the sleeping on guard when we were in camp your conduct has been entirely unexceptionable since you came to the institute sleeping on guard is not i didn't sleep on guard sir interposed richard mildly and respectfully i am prepared to explain all about that now indeed it is rather late now said the principal shaking his head i think i have unearthed the regulators the regulators i haven't heard anything of them for a year i supposed they no longer existed they do exist added richard i happen to know something about them what do you know in reply to this question richard narrated all the particulars of his abduction from his post while doing guard duty but why didn't you tell me about this demanded the colonel surprised and indignant at the audacity of the regulators why did you suffer the penalty of deserting your post when you were innocent i thought it would be better in the end sir i wanted to find out who the regulators were well have you found out i think i have sir who are they i am pretty well satisfied that they are encamped upon green island just now said richard with a smile what evidence have you richard stated at considerable length the facts and incidents which had led him to this conclusion but the colonel was not fully satisfied if you will permit me sir i think i could prove what i say to your entire satisfaction what do you wish to do i wish to visit green island replied richard boldly they would whip you again i am not afraid of them how will you get over to the island the young rascals have taken all the boats i can borrow a skiff if not i can go over on a plank but they would handle you rather roughly i don't intend to let them see me i think i can manage the matter sir well grant your plan will harmonize with mine i intend to punish these mutineers as they foolishly call themselves in a novel way and i have already made my arrangements to do so but you shall carry out your scheme first i should be very glad to do so and i am confident that i shall succeed you shall try it at all events will you let bailey go with me asked richard no i do not wish to expose him to danger you can take care of yourself it appears if you get into trouble do you want some one with you i think it would be better mr gault shall accompany you but you shall manage the matter yourself very well sir what shall i do for a boat you shall have one of the pontoon boats it will be better than a skiff good i didn't think of that said richard with enthusiasm now grant not a word must be said of the events of to-night it was after nine o'clock when this conference was finished and the boys had retired richard and the principal left the office and repaired to the stables where they found three of the instructors including mr gault the horses were attached to the pontoon wagon ready for a start the whole party seated themselves in the vehicle and were driven by the public road to a spot near the shore of the lake one of the rubber boats was unloaded and mr gault and richard carried it down to the bank the night was cloudy and dark green island was half a mile from the place where they proposed to embark and there was no danger that the mutineers would see or hear them the boat was filled with air by the aid of a bellows and placed in the water richard requested mr gault to lie down in the boat and with a short paddle he had brought for the purpose 
he propelled the light craft towards her destination. The utmost care and quiet were necessary to prevent the mutineers from gaining any knowledge of the movement, and when the boat was within a few rods of the island, Richard laid aside his paddle and listened. He could hear the regulators talking and laughing at some distance from the shore, and he soon satisfied himself that no sentinels had been detached to guard the approaches. With a few strokes of his paddle, he brought the boat alongside the island. Richard seemed to be a master of strategy, and conducted his movements with such skill and prudence that he and Mr. Gault succeeded in effecting a landing without disturbing the mutineers. Now, sir, we must lie down and crawl upon the ground till we get within hearing distance of them, whispered Richard. I will follow you, Grant, replied the instructor. We must move very slowly. There is plenty of time. Richard led the way, crawling like a snake upon the grass, so slowly and so cautiously that not a particle of noise seemed to be made. Near the center of the island there was a clump of trees, which had been dignified by the title of a grove. The mutineers were seated upon the ground in this place. Though the distance to the grove from the place where Mr. Gault and Richard had landed was only a few rods, more than half an hour was consumed in reaching a spot which would be near enough to enable them to hear what was said. The deep gloom beneath a spreading oak afforded them a friendly shelter, and here they disposed of themselves to the best advantage to effect the object in view. For half an hour they listened to conversation on all topics. Various wild schemes were proposed to bring the colonel to terms. Some declared their intention to spend a week on the island. We should freeze and starve, said another. No, Leslie, I mean Kennedy, said he would supply us with food, and we can make a tent of the sails of the boat. Let us stick together whatever we do, added another. If we could only have got Grant over here, we should have fixed him. Thank you, said Richard to himself, and he listened to this kind of talk for some time, beginning to fear that he should not obtain the information for which he came. Regulators, come to order, said Nevers, at last, much to the satisfaction of the listeners. Are all present regulators? They are, replied Redman. Guards to your stations. Richard could not see where their stations were, and he hoped the line of their duty would not lead them to the oak under which Mr. Gaunt and himself were seated. It is a long time since we have had a chance to hold a regular meeting, and it may be a long time before we are able to do so again. Perhaps it was lucky that all except the regulators backed out, continued Nevers. You all know the business we have on our hands. We do, replied several. By a judicious use of watermelons and sleepwalking, we shall accomplish our purpose, continued Nevers. We must do it before the next election, my chief, said Redmond. It is of no use to attempt to whip him or anything of that sort, answered my chief which seemed to be the official designation of the presiding officer. I have a plan which I think will procure his expulsion from the school. State it, and every regulator will remember the penalty of disclosing one of the society's secrets. He shall be pounded till he is black and blue, said the members in concert. And every regulator shall despise him as man and boy to the end of his life. That's so, responded the members. Go on, Redmond, said the chief. Next Sunday night, the sheds near the grove will be set on fire. On Friday night, Grant's French exercise book will be taken from his desk. He will fail in his lesson on Saturday, and the colonel must punish him. This will make him mad. The exercise book will be torn up, and pieces of it, especially the cover with his name on it, will be found near the burnt building. Masters, who is on good terms with Grant, on a certain pretense, known to him and me, 
will induce him to wait at the shed until after dark, where he will be seen by Mr. Galt when he goes his rounds. A broken bunch of matches will be found in Grant's closet, where no fellow is allowed to keep matches. Other suspicious circumstances will appear at the time, for they are in charge of proper persons. You hear, said the chief. I don't like the plan, said one, nor I, chimed in a dozen others. It is a mean thing, added the first objector. How many officers has the Society of Regulators? demanded the chief sternly. One whom all obey, replied the members. Who is he? Nevers. I am chief, and I command that this be done, said the chief. Twenty or thirty of the members, as Richard judged by the voices, protested against the scheme, but the measure was ordered in spite of this opposition. Is there a traitor here? demanded the chief. Not one, replied the members. The chief then urged the necessity of using strong measures. He pointed out the danger of permitting Grant to remain in the school, and the plan would ensure his expulsion. But still the intractable ones objected, and their names were ordered to be given. As they were announced, Mr. Gaut, aided by faith rather than sight, wrote them down on the back of some letters he had in his pocket. The business was finished and it was proposed to establish a watch on the island for the night. "'We must go,' whispered Richard, and he crawled off, followed by Mr. Gault. They reached the water without being discovered, and embarked in the rubber boat. "'If they place sentinels on the watch, the colonel's plan will be defeated,' said Mr. Gault. "'What is his plan? To get all the boats away from them, and keep them on the island till they have had enough of it.' "'We must do it before the watch is set,' added Richard. To accomplish this purpose, he paddled the float to the place where the boats were moored, and cast them all adrift. The slight current of the lake carried them slowly down to the river, and the listeners returned to the shore, and reported what they had done to the colonel. The whole party were then driven round to the outlet of the lake, where they secured the boats as they floated down." The business of the night was done, and the party retired to their several apartments. End of chapter 20 Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana Chapter 21 of In School and Out The Conquest of Richard Grant by Oliver Optic This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 Richard annihilates the regulators, and the story is concluded. It would have damaged the self-esteem of the regulators if they could have seen how little notice was taken of their absence at the Institute on the day following the development of the mutiny. Everything went on as usual, and the instructors did not even allude to the rebels or the rebellion. It seemed to be the policy of the principal to maintain a masterly inactivity in regard to them. Perhaps Colonel Brockridge was not so indifferent as he appeared to be. He had stationed men on both sides of the lake to prevent any communication between the mutineers and persons on the shore. At noon it was reported that a boy by the name of Leslie, who lived in Tunbrook, and who had been expelled from the Institute, had attempted to visit the island. Richard was curious to know who Leslie was, for he had heard the name mentioned by the regulators. The first day of November was very mild and pleasant. It was one of the sweet days of the Indian summer, and the rebels on Green Island were highly favored by this circumstance. On the second day the wind changed, and it blew clear and cold from the northwest. Just before sunset, a white flag was seen upon a pole near the landing place on the island. Colonel Brockridge was informed of the fact, and the large sailboat was sent off to relieve the rebels from their uncomfortable situation. Richard and two of the instructors were deputed to visit the island, and ascertain the import of the flag of truce. The teachers were not boatmen, and our hero 
was the only person available as a navigator, and he was too deeply interested in the fate of the regulators to be averse to the visit. On arriving at the island, the rebels were found to be in a very deplorable condition. They had eaten nothing since dinner on the preceding day, and were shivering with cold. Mr. Gault calmly inquired what they wanted. "'We want to return,' replied Nevers, whose teeth chattered as he spoke. "'Step into the boat, then.' But the boat would not carry them all, and it was necessary to make two trips to convey the entire party. On the passage, Richard attended closely to his duty, and did not speak a word to the rebels. The two instructors were as tactern as the boatmen. The party seemed to be astonished that their return created no sensation— no restraint was placed upon them, and when they landed each went where he chose, but most of them found their way to the warm rooms of the Institute. "'Have you had a pleasant time, Nevers?' asked the Colonel, when he met the chief of the regulators. "'Not very, sir,' replied Nevers, with a ghastly smile. This was all the allusion that was made to the affair. Provisions disappeared with astonishing rapidity at the supper-table that night." The regulators looked very tame and chapfallen for a day or two, and Nevers condescended to inform Richard that the whole thing was a bad failure. Colonel Brockridge had requested Mr. Gault and Richard to be entirely silent in regard to what had transpired while they were upon the island. He did not explain his purpose to Richard, but his injunction was faithfully observed. The regulators, even to Nevers and Redmond, were very cordial and considerate towards their intended victim, and Richard believed they had abandoned their wicked purpose, till, on Saturday morning, he missed his French exercise book. Without it, he could not recite his lesson, and he was checked for the failure, and reported to Colonel Brockridge. The principal sent for him, and every boy in school supposed he was under censure for the deficiency. On Sunday night, when the boys were permitted to walk, Masters told Richard that Bailey wished to see him on particular business near the grove shed, as the building was called. Richard promised to meet him at the place assigned. He waited there some time, but as Bailey did not come, he returned to the parlor of the Institute. He met Bailey there, and asked if he wished to see him. Yes, I wanted to show you something in the shed— but it will do just as well in the morning, replied Bailey, somewhat to the astonishment of Richard, who, of course, understood what all these things were for. What was it? asked the intended victim. It was a piece of your exercise book, and I didn't know but the piece might enable you to find the hole. While they were talking, the alarm of fire was given, but before they could reach the spot, some ready hands had extinguished the flames. In accordance with the program laid down upon the island, pieces of Richard's exercise book, some of them half burned, were found in and near the shed. Several cards of matches, and half the printed paper that had enclosed the original bunch, were also picked up near the building, which had been devoted to destruction. An investigation was immediately commenced. The boys were ordered to the schoolroom. The pieces of Richard's exercise book were examined. A dozen boys had seen its owner standing near the shed before the fire originated. The teachers were sent to examine the closets for further evidence. Not only were several cards of matches found in Richard's closet, but also part of the printed envelope that had enclosed them. This piece of paper was a portion of the wrapper, of which the other part had been found in the shed. These facts were duly announced to the boys, and it seemed as clear as noonday that Richard Grant was the incendiary. He was ordered to report forthwith at the office, and the boys were dismissed for the night. "'We have fixed him this time,' said Nevers in a whisper, as he and Redman left the room. "'He is under arrest, and to-morrow he will be sent home in disgrace,' replied Redman, rubbing his hands." "'Nevers, you will be the next captain of Company D. "'We have broken the fellow's idol at any rate. "'Grant will spend the night in the guardhouse,' added Nevers. "'Nevers was slightly mistaken, "'for Richard, 
though he did not appear in barrack b that night occupied the guest chamber of colonel brockridge's private residence his friends especially bailey were gloomy and sad the more lukewarm ones were sure and always had been that grant was a bad boy on monday morning when the boys had assembled in the schoolroom colonel brockridge appeared followed by richard the students understood that the incendiary case was to be settled and a breathless silence pervaded the hall grant stands before you accused of a very grave offence the principal began we cannot permit a boy who sets fire to a building to remain in the institute if guilty he must be expelled but grant assures me this is a conspiracy to injure him he declares that there is a secret organization in the institute called the regulators who have determined to drive him away from the school some of us have heard of such an institution before but its existence has never been clearly proved redmond do you know anything of such an association i never heard of it before sir replied redmond do you nevers no sir grant charges you both with being connected with the regulators let him prove it said nevers in defiant tones who is dobbin asked the principal i never heard the name before answered nevers i think it is very hard to be accused without evidence i hope you will make grant prove what he says sir i will my chief said richard at a nod from the colonel and without giving the source of his information he told all he knew about the regulators how many officers have the regulators asked mr gaunt rising from his chair at the farther end of the room one whom all obey replied richard repeating what he had heard on the island who is he nevers are there traitors among us continued mr gaunt not a traitor what shall be done to him who discloses the secrets of the regulators asked the teacher he shall be pounded till he is black and blue and as man and boy be despised till the end of his life replied richard repeating the words of the regulators as nearly as he could remember them what do you think of this nevers asked the colonel i don't know what it all means sir answered he with a well counterfeited look of astonishment there were a great many pale faces beating hearts and quivering lips in the seats for it was certain that the daylight had been shining in upon the dark doings of the regulators who was the traitor who had betrayed the secrets of the fraternity confusion and trembling overwhelmed the regulators before we proceed any farther continued the principal if there are any of this secret band present who wish to acknowledge their guilt and are willing to be forgiven they may stand the silence was intense and deep nevers and redman did not move a muscle but some of the mutineers glanced at each other and seemed to be in doubt now is the only time for confession added the colonel half a dozen boys rose then one after another followed their example till it seemed as if the whole band intended to absolve themselves from their vows those who rose were ordered to the rear of the room only ten of the band decided to abide the issue they were called out by name here are the rest of the regulators said the colonel when the obdurate ones had taken their places upon the platform mr gaunt told his story and richard told his the evidence was complete and overwhelming two of the teachers had been concealed in the shed and had seen redmond set it on fire and scatter the pieces of the exercise book in the vicinity another had seen masters place the matches in richard's closet the colonel knowing the details of the plot beforehand had arranged everything so as to ensure the conviction of the conspirators boys said colonel brockridge i am happy to inform you that grant is entirely innocent those in their seats received this announcement with a storm of applause i knew he was innocent from the beginning another burst of applause the principal detailed with great minuteness the particulars of the conspiracy with which our readers are already familiar the ten regulators were expelled at once 
and sent away by the next train that left Tunbrook. The whole forenoon was occupied in disposing of the matter. But when the boys were sent out, there was no end to the cheering for Richard Grant. It was plain that Nevers and Redmond were the head and front of the regulators. They were the authors of the association, and when they had gone, the organization died a natural death. Leslie was Kennedy, as Nevers was Dobbin. All the secrets and signs were banded about and laughed at among the boys. Those of the band who remained were punished by being deprived of various privileges, but they behaved themselves afterwards with commendable propriety. One of them ventured to say watermelons one day when he was angry with Richard, but a hundred boys hissed him for it. Three of the expelled regulators were eventually restored, but the lesson they had learned was all sufficient. Richard's victory was complete, and the events we have related rendered him a greater favorite than before. At the spring election he was chosen captain of Company D, and was regarded as the best officer in the line. Richard's victory over himself was as complete as that over the regulators. That good resolution, kept through trial and temptation, eventually reformed his life and character. During the spring vacation he spent a week at home, and rejoiced the hearts of Bertha and his father by the evidence of his reformation. Ben wept for joy, and Naughty Newman couldn't tell for the life of him what had come over Dick. Richard continued two years longer at Tunbrook, and maintained the high character he had won to the last. He was a favorite with the boys, and with the teachers. Colonel Brockridge pointed with pride to Major Grant, which was the title of our hero during the last year of his residence at Tunbrook, as one of the brightest ornaments of his school, and as one of the best fruits of his system of education. And now we must take leave of Richard Grant, and we do so with greater regret than we should have done when his reputation was stained by watermelons and sleepwalking. Our hero is still true to himself. As we use fictitious names, our sympathizing readers will not be able to recognize Colonel Richard Grant, commanding a brigade in the Army of the Potomac, at the present time. But, true to his country in her hour of peril, he has served with that gallant band of brave men from the commencement of the war. If my young friends would conquer others, if they would be chosen of men to reign in the hearts of their fellow beings, and thus guide the destinies of men and nations, if they would be chosen of God to do His work in earth and heaven, they must first conquer themselves. End of chapter 21 End of In School and Out The Conquest of Richard Grant by Oliver Optic Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana